Well, obviously, I think even from the examples we're just hearing here, there, there are different styles of reporting and there are different rules for different mediums so, or media. So let's have a look at a couple of examples. Can we have a look at the Sydney Morning Herald uh, example first up? Now, this is uh, one, you won't be able to read it all, but uh, you may be familiar with this particular, um, with this particular uh, website, online website. Uh, this is the Sydney Morning Herald website. And this is, in fact, an article about what we were talking about with Joe just a few minutes ago about this article about the high-protein protein diet. Um, I think if we just point out a couple of things about this, you can see this is written by a science uh, editor. or well, certainly goes through the, the vein of a science editor. It's in a, in a well-being section of the paper. It's with a relatively um, respected mainstream paper, the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, would uh, both of you know this article? Um, yeah. What do you uh, think about this particular one? Well, I quite um, enjoy reading things that Nikki Phillips writes um, because she usually quotes genuine researchers and she doesn't only quote that researcher, but she will often go to other people who research in, the, in a similar area and get their opinion on the story. So there is some balance there. I don't think she, uh, I mean, the, the main problem I have often is when people report about studies is they didn't look up the conflict of interest. And I, I think she does sort of, she obviously has read the whole study, not just the abstract. Mm. And so I think that's important. So, you know, I, I would always be happy to talk to, to uh, Nikki and be sure that I would be correctly quoted. Jo, obviously, you know, there are journalists who would come through your centre to try to get, um, get the right take on this, or any take mm. on it, maybe, hopefully the right take. Um, a, a paper like, or a, a, an article in this sort of scenario, would that be? I think we probably sent Nikki that paper and uh, sorted out, you know, may have even sorted out the experts that she, she spoke to for her, which is part of what we do at the centre, is find good quality scientific experts to speak to journalists when they're writing about scientific subjects, and that's just to make sure that uh, you know, the person who's the, the expert comment in, in those articles is the genuine article themselves, mm -hmm. and they're not a pseudoscientist, and they're not you know, a, a PR or somebody with a, a kind of vested interest in the topic, somebody who works for a, a diet company. Um, so yes, we work with Nikki a lot, and um, lots of the other science specialist journalists to try and help them find good people in the field like Rosemary who can give them a, mm. a genuine comment from an expert point of view. So from a general point of view, not just Nikki's article here, but from a general point of view when it comes to a news article about a science or health topic, how reliable generally are they? Well, there are certain things you can look out for that um, can at least help you judge how, uh, how, how you know, the, the, the source of the study um, you know, and how reliable that might be. So you're, the, the things to start alarm bells ringing are things like surveys that are, are not based on actual research. So look for a reference to um, the name of a journal to know that it's, it's an actual study. And look for things like the number of people involved in the study. Um, is it a randomized controlled trial? Details like that. Now, those details aren't always in the story but there are certain things that should flag it as possibly unreliable, and that includes if it's a study that includes very few people, if it's a survey, mm. if there's any mention of this having been funded by the Atkins Foundation, for example, you know, then the, the, there are some things you can look out for. I, I guess we're talking about um, uh, newspaper articles here. I guess from my po point of view, there's uh, radio, there's TV. Um, that's perhaps not always as clear. Uh, do you find that th there is as much interest in trying to get genuine researchers or science or scientists on about those sorts of things in the broadcast and telecast mediums? I think it probably varies a bit between channels and programmes. Yes. You know, so um, you guys at the ABC tend to be quite uh, careful about making sure that um, you're not uh, exaggerating studies and things out there for the, for the sake of a good story mm. and not bending the truth too, too far. There are others, I'll name no names, who might be a bit less scrupulous about that and they're more interested in getting the audience in with something that sounds sensational than they are in presenting the facts in a slightly more sort of sober way, if you like. Yeah. Well, um, obviously, like I've diverted there a bit, but let's, let's take a look at perhaps a comparative article. We've been looking at the Sydney Morning Herald there, but can we have the body and soul one now? 
that's all right. Now, this is a, an article uh, in Adelaide Now, Body and Soul. Uh, this is an article on detox. Now, Rosemary, you've had a look at this one too. Uh, oh, this might actually make it a bit clearer. This is the sort of lift out that this article would be in, although it's on a website there. Uh, as you can see, this would be a lift out from a paper uh, where, that's, uh, where that's in. So um, an article like this, Rosemary, you're, is it valid? Well, no, it gives very little detail. Of course, this doesn't just uh, appear in Adelaide, Body and Soul goes no. into papers in, in other states as well. It has very, very big readership. They do like to keep it very light and they would uh, contact me quite often and often I have to say, look, I really, there's just no validity in that story and so they're not particularly interested. Sometimes they are. Uh, but they always want it to be very light and airy-fairy. They don't want, you know, too much anything that might be boring. Science talk. Yes, they want science talk and boring. Unfortunately, that comes up with some of these sorts of things where they make outrageous statements backed up by nothing. So they're not referring to any, any particular study that might have been done. There's no um, reference <coughs> to it. The whole idea that you can reduce your toxic load in seven days, well, I mean, if it sounds too good to be true, it is usually. You know? <laughs> it, we, we, we need to sort of have a bit of common sense there. So this sort of thing really, I suppose it, it, it annoys me a bit. Um, and probably it came because somebody had a product to sell. I mean, I... I have written for most magazines and newspapers around the place, and I get the press releases too, the media releases. And what I often see in this is exactly word for word what somebody sent me, um, not in this particular instance, but no. in many instances in, in Body and Soul. It'll be word for word the exact stuff that came out in the media release, because I've got it on my desk too. And that sort of gets to me, because I think this journalist hasn't done anything to actually find out about the story uh, they've just parroted off something from somebody selling usually some supplement. And so, Joe, would that be a paid supplement or ad? Or is that, you know, that type of thing when it is literally just a press release? Yeah, well, I don't, I don't, don't know, body and, I don't know body and Soul, but I think it's a genuine publication. So it's something yeah. that's um, appeared there and they've basically syndicated it and, and mm. used it themselves. So, well, I would it, doubt they'd be paid for it, but this is public relations people like to feed information mm. through. I mean, they get success by getting publicity for something for which no, no money changes hands. So there may be an ad for something else and this there gives it an editorial, ad paper, editorial yeah. credibility. Yeah. Yeah. There's often an ad for whatever the, the pro a product that's mentioned there. Yeah. So, Joe, are there differences in the rules? I mean, we started off talking about the rules and regulations here, but are there differences in the rules that sort of talk about a news article as opposed to... A lift out like no, that? No, no, there aren't. Um, so if you see stuff like this, uh, it might be a pain, but complain, because that's the only way that um, the situation will change with the, the kind of printing of this kind of stuff, as if it was fact, um, when it's not. So, but but like I said before, you know, it's nothing will be done unless you complain. But it's subject to the, those same rules that it should not really be printed as fact because there's no evidence to back it up. But again. There's no one controlling it, really. There's nothing. There's no organisation with real teeth that's patrolling it. Yep, yep. So it's this self-regulatory system again. So what are they going to do? Give themselves a slap on the wrist? But uh, the only way that you know you can complain, the only way that anything will ever happen to change this is if people actually draw attention to it, because mm. the system's set up so it's not being actively policed in that way. It takes a complaint for them to even sit up and take notice. I'm not sure how many people are aware. I know I'm not. How many dedicated science health reporters are there out there? Um, not a whole lot. Uh, we lost a lot of journalists in the last sort of year and a half or so in Australia. Um, probably thousands of journalists lost their jobs because the business models of the big media organisations just started to, to go awry. Um, and they realised they were going to have to seriously cut back. So it's always been the case in Australia that a lot of science and health was presented, uh, was written by general reporters. Um, and that's the case actually all over the world is that people who don't have a specialism in that subject get told they're doing this today. And that's part of the reason for shoddy journalism sometimes is that these people just don't have the background knowledge to do a fantastic job. So they're working in hard circumstances. <coughs> but uh, we really but did. Does it, are you seeing an increase in people asking for help then by, because they don't have that 
personal knowledge at yes, the Science yeah, Media Centre? Uh, yep, and we're seeing uh, far fewer specialised um, reporters. That's actually not just in science, that's across the board. And far more uh, younger people brought in that can pay less, um, mm. who, who take on a general reporter position and then are, can be doing politics one day and physics the next day. So it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a very tough, tough job that they have getting their heads around all that. And well, I'm glad they're at least bringing you, though. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think... That's encouraging. We, we do get used a lot, and I think particularly, you know, the, the fact that we um, filter through a lot of the research that comes out in any given week and send them a list of stuff that we think is of interest mm. and pretty good um, yeah. helps give them ideas of stories to write. There is an American, uh, Australian uh, Medical Writers Association, uh, of which I've been a member since it started, I think. But um, I think there's a lot of feeling there that they can't get jobs, you know, that, and yet they, they do do quite a bit of um, internal training to, to tr sort of try and take the people you're talking about who are told you're the medical writer for this magazine who knows, or, or newspaper who knows nothing about it. Um, and so if they join the Medical Writers Association, they will get some help as to how to, to look at things there. So, but that's just been within, really pushed by a few people who run that organisation and try to improve the value. But many of them are out of work. Mm. I mean, pretty well everything I write for regularly is gone. You know, I've got much more time to give. I'm going to have much more time in the garden, I think. <laughs> but it's also something that uh, we do a bit of at the centre is um, try and provide a sort of basic training for journalists that they could access really easily online mm. about how to understand stats and things like that so that hopefully they can make a, a bit, a bit of a, a better judgment as to whether scientific research is valid or if it's you know something to push away and not bother reporting mm. because it, it's not strong enough. I wonder though whether something like this would have the same level of scrutiny as an article in the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, well, yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing. It might just <coughs> go, un go rather unnoticed, and that's really the problem. If people don't complain, then it really will go Or don't un think twice, Go maybe. unnoticed, yeah. You know. I mean, it's not the first thing you think when necessarily when you see something that's not great in the newspaper, oh, I must complain mm. about that. Um, but, it <coughs> you know, the way that the system is with this self-regulation and it's very soft touch, um, it's one thing certain, if you don't complain, then absolutely nothing's going to change. 